Hey, 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 welcome to the Musicians Talk Show, episode 29. I'm one of your co-hosts, Dallas Dwight. Hey, everybody, what's up? It's Matt. <laughs> that was so abrupt. Today's podcast is brought to you by Banzoogle. Banzoogle makes it easy to build a stunning website for your music in just minutes. That is not an exaggeration. Choose from hundreds of mobile-friendly themes, customize your design and content in just a few clicks with their easy visual editor. You don't need to know coding. It's not daunting. It's easy. Anyone can do it. You got to check it out. All the features you need for a professional website are already built into this service, including how to sell your or tools, rather, how to sell your music and merch commission free. They're not going to take any money from you there right on your website mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send newsletters integrations to pull in your content from all your online services anything you can think of like twitter instagram and so forth and really really good live support from their musician friendly team seven days a week if you need anything these guys are going to help you out and they're all musicians or married to musicians or affiliated with the industry in some way so they can help you out for sure banzoogle plans start at just 829 a month and include your own free custom domain name in that price go to banzoogle.com to try it free for 30 days and be sure to use our promo code tmts that's tmts for the musicians talk show to get 15 percent off the first year of your subscription banzoogle websites built for musicians by musicians who do we have today matt we have Jordan Rudis, the keyboard extraordinaire from Dream Theater. From Dream Theater, one of my, other? one of my favorite bands of all time. Liquid so this was a too, this right? was a really a really special one for me. Yeah. yeah, I love Dream Theater, and unfortunately, Matt was not here for this one. So. I wasn't unfortunately. unfortunately. I really wanted to be. I almost had to call in sick for work. <laughs> <laughs> I could not I feel do a little it. under the weather. Yeah. <laughs> what do you have? Metal. <laughs> <laughs> severe case severe doctor case. says i'm not allowed to go to work incurable <laughs> yeah so matt missed this one unfortunately but i held down the fort and we had a great interview i think yeah. uh we talk about how he got started in music his journey to to being in dream theater which is fascinating um his approach to studying music and all sorts of cool stuff uh, from the man himself so let's hear it uh, let's hear it from him and not me let's get started <laughs> I wanted to kind of start at the top. Let's let's talk about how you got started in music. Sure. Um, basically, my uh, beginnings were uh, noodling around on my second grade um, classroom piano. Uh, there was a piano in the back of the class. I would go play a little bit. Um, but I didn't have a piano at home. So... Um, uh, my, my mother got a call from the teachers telling her how I was playing the piano in the class and she was a bit surprised because there was really no music in the home. So <laughs> I think the next uh, week she bought a piano and started me on uh, lessons. One of these guys who comes around mm -hmm. weekly and uh, gives you the half an hour session from the Little Red Book. Right. Um, which quickly changed over to uh, him teaching me more how to find all the chords and uh, being interested in my improvisational skills, which mm -hmm. I guess were uh, uh, interesting from the beginning. And then, uh, and then once, uh, once my parents and some close friends kind of understood that I was, uh, I guess, not the, not the ordinary student playing the piano, they moved me to a very serious teacher who then prepared me to go to Juilliard, which I entered at nine years old and began a very serious classical wow. uh, path. Yeah. So what was that like at, at that young? Mm. It was uh, it was pretty intense. Uh, you know, I was surrounded by kids who were like writing operas and symphonies, and I, even at, at amazingly young ages, I can remember vividly, like you know, hearing about the uh, you know the ten year old who just completed writing his first opera. Um, but it was, uh, you know, it was just very serious, very focused study. My teacher, my main piano teacher wasn't really that interested, uh, in, you know, the, in my, uh, improvisational skills or anything like that. She just right. wanted to make sure that I had a proper piano technique and really learned to, you know, play the instrument well. So it was a very, very classical strict kind of thing. Well, Juilliard is about as strict and classical as you can get. Yeah. <laughs> and prestigious, my, too, my, I mean. Yeah, my teacher actually was from the uh, lineage of Rosina Levine, who's probably one of the most uh, renowned piano teachers of the last century. That's intense. <laughs> so, I mean, that was a problem, honestly a huge part of, of what made you you, right? Yeah, I, I would have to say... You know, just in my career, everything I've done is very much 
um, attributed to the amazing um, focus study that I had. You know, this just the way my kind of brain connects to my fingers and all the time that I've spent on that and the good education I had with learning how to do that, with learning how to have a proper technique. I mean, that's my main, you know, kind of my main medium to express music is through a keyboard. And, you know, I just feel so lucky to have learned early on how to, uh, you know, develop a strong technique and how to continue to uh, develop it and, you know, keep my hands in good shape. So, Right. I mean, so you obviously didn't end up in a classical environment, so to speak. So when, when and where did that change occur? Um, well, all along, I, I've always been interested in like improvisation. And like I would play, my mother would bring home sheet music to different uh, Broadway, you know, shows and music from movie scores. And this, and so she'd always put this music in front of me that was basically like, you know, just the guitar, uh, just the guitar chords and just single notes. And I was, would, I would always just automatically kind of like play it. So mm -hmm. I had that, you know, play different arrangements every time or whatever. So I always had that going on. And my, certainly my high school friends and, you know, people around me appreciated that, although that wasn't what I was studying. But when I was about 16 or 17, my friends started to turn me on to, you know, progressive rock. So I'd be like exposed to like a Genesis album or Pink Floyd or mm -hmm. one one day in particular uh, was a turning point because one of my friends brought over the Tarkus album. Mm -hmm. so the Tarkus album by Emerson, Lake and Palmer was the, uh, the one that really uh, in a big way changed my life because all of a sudden I heard this amazing keyboardist having all this power uh, using a keyboard and I had never been exposed, I'd have been exposed to the harmonic rhythmic aspects of all that, but I would never, I was never exposed to the kind of sheer raw power that one could achieve in front of a keyboard. So that was uh, an amazing awakening. And that's when I started to, you know, really think about, mm, kind of want to get into more of this, uh, especially when I heard Patrick Mraz playing, Minimoog and doing his solo work on, like, right. uh, he had a group called Refugee with the members that used to be in Not, uh, The Nice, which was Keith Emerson's band. And um, when I heard that, I was like, oh my God, amazing. And one day the, the uh, high school friends brought over to my house a Moog Sonic 6 synthesizer and uh, I started to play with that. So all things considered, what was happening was that I was getting ready to graduate from the preparatory school at Juilliard. So I was 18 and I needed to make a decision about college. And then there's a lot of, you know, uh, school and family pressure to continue with the Juilliard path. But in order to do that, you have to re-audition for the college level. So I did, I, did I, I decided to go for that and I practiced really hard and I auditioned for the college and then I got in and I got a scholarship and uh, all this, you know, kind of accolades around it. But the reality was that I was still getting more into like doing other things. Right. And uh, as I uh, as I as, as I mentioned in my uh, my new little uh, concert tour that I'm doing, which is from Bach to Rock, uh, which will probably be over by the time people hear this, at least that leg, the European leg. Um, you know, I uh, walked into a classroom, played the G minor Chopin Ballade, and then when she just grabbed the music from me after four days of playing it and told me that I needed to memorize it, you know, even in the first week, I said, you know what, I'm out of here. This, I got other things to do. <laughs> so I ended up staying at Juilliard for a little less, Juilliard College for a little less than a year, but I was there from the age of nine. So I figured I had a bunch of time there. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you definitely got what you needed out of it, at least. What is what does the prep look like for a tough audition like that for you? Oh well, that's something I that kind of prep. Uh, the closest I've come to that is is the practice I've been doing for these concerts I'm getting ready to do. Um, it's not uh, it, it's really really serious, and only the people who have done things like you know this kind of work know what that's all about. I mean, you know, we're playing in a rock band, even playing in like Dream Theater, which is a highly technical rock band. The uh, what what gets me kind of like, you know, through that, if you will, is the technique that I've developed through the years. And even though some of the music we play is hard, there's a difference in like trying to play like a list Hungarian Rhapsody 
uh, or a Chopin etude or even a ballade to where you can perform it in public when it's all on you. Right. And that's, you know, that takes hours and hours a day of like, and consistent too, to be able to do that. Um, you know, I've been, I've been shedding at the acoustic piano just to get my fingers like, you know, in the position where I can play mm-hmm. an entire night and keep control, you know, of some of these really hard passages when there might be some, you know, a little bit of nerves involved or whatever to, uh, um, you know, make it that much more challenging to keep these really difficult pieces together. So it's a matter of really grounding oneself into the, into the music and, being so comfortable, you know, one of the one of the things I think about a lot is it's funny because um, it's a more recent thing, and that is from our amazing drummer in Dream Theater, um, Mike Mangini. Of course, because, you know, he came in and he nailed his audition with Dream Theater. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was early morning; he was like the first guy that day, and he really, really did a great job. And he's an amazing study. You know, he's just really he's a bit of a professor there himself. Matter of fact, he taught uh, at, at Berkeley. Um, college of music but mike told me that the way he prepares is he 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 prepares for any situation he'll practice with his hands wet he'll practice in the dark he'll practice much too fast he'll practice much too slow he'll practice with his drums in a weird configuration he'll just like he'll be yeah. so ready for anything that, is, that might come up that's huge and that and that really stayed with me i mean you, you have these guys you know these amazing players like you know, and I'll point to the guys in my band, like a Petrucci or my young, or, you know, Mangini. And they, what do you think like, they're doing backstage? They're not like putzing around and, you know, socializing, really. They're, they got their metronome on and they're practicing. And that's, uh, people don't want to hear this because it's not that fun. I know. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the hard work is never fun, right? <laughs> every, everybody, everybody, everybody wants to play music. And, you know, and in a lot of cases, they'll look up to, you know, a band like Dream Theater. But the reality is that if you want to play, you know, like somebody who's very advanced on their instrument, then you're going to have to unfortunately do the work. Of course, you know, that said, there's a lot of people who are playing, you know, music on tools that are not quite so physical, like if somebody's making music on a computer, which I which I don't you know, have anything against. Uh, some people, you know, are against that concept altogether, but I'm not. I think that whatever tool you use to make music, you have to really, you know, be great at. So it's going to take work no matter what. But there's a reality in playing a physical instrument, any physical instrument, guitar, piano, harp, trombone, clarinet, violin, where you can't avoid the um, kind of like the brain to uh, hand uh, or brain to mouth or whatever, like that that connection between your physical body and your mind, mm-hmm. which is the only way you're going to get it done. So it just takes time and focus and practice and and you know even you know lessons, no matter how you get them, whether you're of this generation and you're studying YouTube in slow motion or whatever. You need to uh, well at some point you need to work with somebody because somebody needs to put their eye on you if you're a player of any sort to get an outside perspective and and give you some feedback. Right, absolutely valuable stuff what about contrasting prepping for a juilliard style audition with prepping for a dream theater tour or any sort of more rock progressive kind of thing what how does that look for you um prepping for uh like a juilliard audition usually means you've been playing the same pieces for many months uh especially as a younger person maybe when you're a little older you have a bigger repertoire you don't have to necessarily spend as much time right. but when you're younger Usually, like it's like somebody's doing a, uh, con- a concert in a recital at the Juilliard Preparatory uh, School between the ages of whatever and you know really really super young and uh, you know and eighteen. Then you you figure you've been playing the pieces for some months and you've been playing them every day and you've been doing like you've been even performing them in your particular teachers like uh, Saturday afternoon class for the other students just to you know keep kind of like prepare for whatever recital you're doing or recital hall or even audition for something important. Um, So that's, you know, that's probably more serious than most people imagine. Um, Hours a day, you know, playing the same pieces and just like really, really shedding them Mm -hmm. and then preparing for whatever event it is. And then what about... And then the, um, when the, dream, you're... Then the dream theater part of it. So then, uh, I mean, something, there are certain sections in a dream theater composition that mm-hmm. like, since I'm, you know, I'm basically writing my own parts. Um, sometimes I'll really provide a challenge for myself. 
and I'll do something with, let's say, both hands that I'll try to put something together that is just kind of ridiculous or, you know, it might be fun to write. And then I, all of a sudden I go, oh, my God, what did I do to myself? I really got to figure out how to play this. <laughs> so in that case, it takes, you know, a similar kind of thing where I'll have to sit there and I'll have to really play it slowly with the metronome. Right take my time and maybe one hand at a time and but that gets that's more like you know a certain section a whole song is not mm -hmm. going to be the whole thing is not like a chopin etude where the entire piece from beginning to end is just a total bitch yeah there's <laughs> exactly other, there's other <laughs> players there's other there's other players that will take the the lead so i can you know there's places to relax i can mm -hmm. you know and i would say in every piece of music i've ever played with dream theater there are times when i'm only playing with one hand because all I need to do is hit some chords or whatever. Right. So even a song like, uh, you know, Dance of Eternity or Breaking All Illusions, which have some hard things, or um, The Gift of Music, which is mostly just kind of a, a fairly straight ahead kind of rock thing, but there's a part in it, Gift of Music is a good example. There's a part in it towards the end where I'm playing a figure in the left hand, um, kind of root fifth octave thing that's kind of moving spider-like, but in the right hand is this ridiculous, fast, almost zappa type weird line and that took some time to coordinate so that you know that's a matter of sitting down and really like nailing that maybe still not as uh not as deep as like doing the you know hungarian rhapsody by list mm -hmm. or something however um you know because it's a shorter passage and because i wrote it myself and you know different reasons or whatever sure so that's a little bit of a perspective of it, but and, still a lot of work to get it, to yeah. get it nailed down. And and yeah. you have a team, you know, you can rely on your teammates to help, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about music school. Is that something you think you would recommend for all musicians, some musicians? I mean, what is your recommendation for um, musicians thinking about going to music school? I think education is always a really good thing. I would never say that it's, it's not a positive, uh, helpful um, type of uh, thing to engage in, whether it's, you know, going to a school like a Berkeley or Musicians Institute or Juilliard or whatever. Um, you know, there's so much to be learned by being with peers, by being with pe experienced teachers. I mean, if you're out on your own, I mean, you know, the, the music world is a, uh, an interesting place. You have everybody from like the, just this pop songwriter who, you know, might just be kind of a natural and figure out somehow how to write songs with very little training that can make it for various reasons or whatever to an, ex, you know, incredibly experienced virtuoso. Um, but I would say from uh, <clears throat> a point of, I guess, experience and, 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 uh, I don't know, just having studied this this for a long time, that every everybody should, if they have the opportunity, go and do some studying, you know, especially if you're trying to play a physical instrument, then there's no there's no question about it. Uh, and then somebody says, oh, I just write songs, you know, like I'm just a songwriter, I don't need to do that. But then again, reality is, unless you know how to put your hand in different, different kinds of chords smoothly in different positions, you're not really going to get the most... You know, you're not going to get the most out of it. You're going to be, you know, stumbling and therefore your possibilities will be limited. So if all you can do is kind of play chords in root position and you can't connect them in a smooth way because you have no training, because you never took the time to do that, then you're missing out. So it's uh, music is, you know, yes, there's magic to it, but, you know, it's not magic. And uh, to be able to, to be able to effectively express yourself on a musical instrument takes time and and some form of education whether it's personal with some with just a teacher or whether it's a school and certainly you know all the tools that they're that are out there right now i would say unless you're like a real rocket scientist shedding you know in manuals whatever you know you kind of need to study like how all these uh uh you know, tools work like the, from the synthesizers to the audio tools to the virtual instruments to the DAWs. They're very involved, you know. And, and when I grew up, it was a little bit different in that you had things like, uh, you know, you didn't have these kind of schools all around the place. Mm -hmm. uh, you had instruments like a Minimoog, which just had like a bunch of knobs on it. You could turn them and make sound, and you didn't necessarily need a, a full Berkeley education to. Uh, you know, kind of figure out what, what happened when you turned a knob and moved, uh, you know, a wheel. So it wasn't until later when things got digital and all of a sudden the screens became really small. And it was kind of like if you didn't know what 
you know, things were, like what the various kinds of synthesis parameters were, you didn't stand a chance of doing anything on the synthesizer because you couldn't, you couldn't. <laughs> right. So I happened to grow up in a period where, you know, you had like mini modes where mm -hmm. I could do it organically. I didn't have to know what all the technicalities meant. I had to kind of learn that along the way. And, uh, and I did that not by going to like Berkeley or something like that because it wasn't available to me back then. I didn't, you know, I didn't even know about such things, but I did that by becoming part of some of the companies that were making these and kind of, you know, like being there and learning from my peers and mm -hmm. people who had just had the information. Right, exactly. And it, and it's gotten so much more expansive. So like you said, it's, it's a daunting task right now. <laughs> so what about um, moving to a major city? Is that something you think is crucial for success today? Or is it fine if someone just kind of stays wherever they are and uses the power of the internet? Um, I think that certainly the power of the internet, you can do amazing things and certainly and people have, but I think it's, uh, I think it's great if you can be, I think it's important and great if you can, you know, add a social element, like a, not, not social media, but a social element uh, to developing your career. Um, you know, none of these things is everything, but it does help to be, you know, kind of like where the action is. An example being like somebody who's in LA and who's a good player, they can certainly go to one of the jams at one of the hot clubs and if they can sit in, it's a good chance that they'll start to meet people and, uh, you know, and make relationships and then be called upon when something comes up. It's kind of like, you know, one way or another, you ha you, first of all, you have to develop your skill and be a great player. But then you also have to stay in people's radar. You know, like uh, somebody wants to be in the film business. Yeah, you can send emails. You can do whatever you do in, you know, bumfuck who knows where. Um, but unless you're right in the community, they're, they're not necessarily going to embrace you and bring you in. You kind of you kind of have to figure out how to, you know, be in the community, you know, of, of, um, of people who are doing things that are similar to what you want to do, whether it's, you know, just being a studio musician or you want to be a, a film composer. You know, like if you're on the road all the time, like me, you know, basically you're a part of the, like, you know, the the touring community and then you and then you get calls to do more touring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's kind of like one thing leads who, to the next, to the next, to the next. Yeah. I mean, you walk through a certain, it's all about like the kind of, and I've been thinking about this quite a bit lately just because it's an interesting thing to analyze, but you walk through a particular door of the industry and that's kind of like the one you walk through and that's the one you develop and other, and although somebody might have talents to, uh, you know, be part of other, other areas of a business, that's not what you've been focusing on. So and maybe not even, not even the area where you've been living. So uh, for a young person, I mean, of course, we know or I know a lot of young people who say, I've got to I've got to go to L.A., you know, because that's where it all is. And I you can't really argue with that. All you can say is, well, you know, all, you, all I could think or say is, well, that could be really hard because, you know, certainly there are challenges that you're moving into a community where everybody and their mother who plays an instrument wants to be there. And all of a sudden you're in the thick of it. But, uh, you know, there's the other side of it, which is, yeah, if you're, uh, if you're like a young musician or composer or whatever, it makes sense to be in an area where it's happening, you know, it's a, there's a community around, around, uh, right. that kind of can, can hopefully in, embrace you and you can be kind of figure out how to become part of it. Absolutely. And I think all that competition is indicative of, you know, all the available slots, like all the available slots are there. So everyone's going to go there and compete, right? Right, right. I mean, none, none of these things are easy, and uh, you know, people want them to be. Maybe some people imagine that they are easier if they're not informed. But the best thing that you can do is to, you know, master your instrument. If it's a computer or if it's a piano or a tuba, um, you know, become comfortable um, with yourself and with people, so you can uh, use the social element. And maybe, I mean, you know, social media as well as just, you know, being social in the real world. Uh, and, and if you have talent and you're able to get out there and interface and engage and interact, then you stand a chance of making it happen. Right. So what led you to Dream Theater? And if I'm to understand this correctly, you almost joined once and didn't and then did join later. Is that correct? 
Yes, that's correct. Okay. See, so, I never knew that. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. So uh, what led me to Dream Theater? So it started out many years ago. I was at an AM show, and um, my wife, Danielle, who I refer to as like the wizard behind the curtain, uh, was there, and she, um, she ran into Jan Hammer and uh, dragged Jan Hammer, figured out a way to drag Jan Hammer into the chord booth where I was working to hear me play. And um, so he did, and I, so I was working at Korg at the time, and then months later after meeting Jan Hammer, uh, he contacted me at Korg and he wanted me to tour with him because he wanted to go out on a tour playing all his music, uh, but he only wanted to play the guitar and play leads, so he hired me to do all the like orchestrational parts uh, and also in the band with Tony Williams um, and Fernando Saunders on bass. And, um, and that was a lot of fun. But fast forward to, um, to some years later, and Jan Hammer's manager uh, got a call from Dream Theater's manager at the time because they were looking for uh, a keyboardist when Kevin Moore was going to leave. And Jan Hammer's manager, a guy named Elliot, was, um, told them, oh, you should check out Jordan. Jan won't do it or can't do it, but you should check out Jordan Rudis. So it was that uh, that little tip they got. Plus, I had met um, um, Jerry Goodman, who's the violinist, when he was performing at the NAMM show as well. The NAMM show, of course, is the big yearly music manufacturer mm -hmm. show that I'm usually a part of when I'm not on tour. But in those days, it was a major point of getting connections for me. I, also, in those days, Keyboard Magazine, which was very vibrant, would write about me and voted me like best new keyboardist or something like that. So, um, you know, between all of those things, so Dream Theater did give me a call and I went and I auditioned for them. Uh, and this was right after they did the Awake album. Okay. Uh, so if Kevin Moore recorded the Awake album with them and then he left. Uh, so it was right after that, and they needed a keyboard player. So I went to audition and um, really liked the guys. I thought they were cool. I showed them one of my pieces called Over the Edge, which was this kind of very progressive thing that I wrote. They, and I had to learn Pull Me Under and Take the Time, which I really enjoyed learning. So I ended up doing one concert with them uh, at the Foundations Forum. They really needed somebody to be there and, uh, and to do that with them because it was a major thing because they just had an album release. Um, and then, so I did that, I enjoyed that. But after I did that and found out the realities of what joining really meant at that point, and also what the, uh, what the other options for me in my life were at that point, I decided not to join them. And that year I took a tour with the Dixie Dregs, um, who actually have a big reunion that's just started. I don't know if you know that group. It's with Steve Morris and Absolutely. Rod Morgan. Absolutely, love Steve Morris. Yeah, so... Um, so I took that gig instead, and I had a gig at Kurzweil doing some like product-related uh, things, demos and clinics and all this stuff. And so I figured I would just kind of keep all that going um, and not make the Dream Theater commitment at that point. So uh, although, I, again, I really like the guys. Obviously, they're so talented, and it was an interesting group. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know where they were going, though, but thought maybe it could end pretty soon or not, or who knows. So I got a call not long, uh, you know, after that point to um, gauge my interest in a project that Portnoy was putting together, Mike Portnoy, and that project was Liquid Tension, exper turned into Liquid ex Tension Experiment, which just had its 20-year, uh, you know, release uh, mm -hmm. date as of a couple of days ago. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, so... Got that call, and I thought, oh, okay, so I have the opportunity to work with Mike Portnoy, mm -hmm. even though I didn't make the Dream Theater gig, and maybe that would be cool. So um, decided to uh, to say yes to that, and then next thing you know, John Petrucci became part of that project as well. So here I am working with John Petrucci and Mike Portnoy, and, uh, but it's on a side project for them. And also we brought in Tony Levin to play the bass. So... Yeah, so what happened was that we, as Liquid Tension Experiment, we ended up putting together two very successful instrumental albums. Um, and then uh, after that, after we did that, um, they, the guys reapproached me again. They had been touring with a guy named Derek Sherinian. And um, 
for whatever reasons, they decided to uh, try to make a change. And they, Mike uh, Portnoy and John Petrucci, you know, asked me again if I'd be interested to uh, consider again joining Dream Theater. Uh, I think, yeah, I think maybe John wanted to have a, you know, he, he, the guys saw how effective it was for us to be writing music together. And they really wanted to have somebody who was a, a composer that could be of John's, you know, kind of a partner, if you will, to get things done. So at that point, things had changed a bit. I got to know the guys. I thought, oh, I like them personally. And, you know, musically, we're obviously getting along. This is all very cool. So yes, okay, I'll join. So that was the end of 1998. And then 1999, Scenes from a Memory was released, which was the first album that I did with Dream Theater. And now it's almost 20 years after that. So Yeah. <laughs> but, Man. Right. Mm -hmm. um, how'd you get into the tech world? How did that switch happen? Well, I had been working for um, companies like Korg and Kurzweil, as I had mentioned. Even before that, I was mm -hmm. when I was in my 20s, I worked for a company that was doing... Um, com music, uh, music and graphics for the 8-bit computers. I was kind of like the guy who would show up at the meetings with the stock uh, investors and prove to them that we knew music. But it was a very in interesting and small group of guys that were doing some very kind of cool cutting-edge things with computers. So I've always been interested in instruments and, you know, at that point really had kind of a fascination for what the power was for, you know, computers and music and technology. And, um, and through the years, stayed very much kind of involved with the whole, like, you know, manufacture side of things and the, the instruments and, you know, everything from programming sounds for the instruments for even designing some features uh, for the instruments. So um, one day, uh, not all that long ago, when the first iPhones came out, I started to put my hand on those. And it was before any kind of app store was even around. And... I had like an inspiration or kind of a vision, if you will, for what this kind of um, uh, multi-touch experience could create musically. And, and uh, I just really was excited about what I was thinking. And uh, actually a funny story is that uh, it was around my 50th birthday and my wife and I had just invested a huge uh, kind of purchase in a beautiful nine foot Steinway grand. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had gotten the iPhone like the same week, but the iPhone was the thing that was really capturing my attention. So I'm sitting around playing with this, making like hardly any sounds <laughs> really too much at that point. And, uh, and whatever visual was on the screen, I think they had a very preliminary kind of almost like hand drawn, like piano, key, you know, a few notes for right. a piano keyboard, I'm sitting there playing around with it. And my wife was like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> incredibly you know, expensive, like amazing piano, and you're sitting there playing with your iPhone. And I said, no, 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 honey, I got something in mind. I really do. I, I, I got like a, you know, I got a vision here in my head. Just leave me alone. Leave me alone. So, <laughs> of course, this is one of the one of the few times that I was right, and I stayed with that. There you go. <laughs> and I, I made some calls and uh, to some people that I had met in the programming community that were also just getting kind of started in the, in the, uh, you know, Apple iOS world uh -huh. wasn't much going on in, it in those days. Um, so this is right when the iPhone came out. So like Oh seven. Yeah. Yeah. Right. When it came out and I met a guy named Kevin Chartier, who was a wonderful, brilliant guy. And we got very inspired and we created an application called Morphwiz, which is my first app, which was a, uh, one billboard, uh, award first place in billboard, for the best music app of that year. That's so awesome. it was a big, big deal, and it got Apple's attention. And I kind of like, uh, you know, was able to befriend some some people at Apple and be and make a statement in the you know in the app store space. And also, mm -hmm. it was kind of a cutting edge, very cool application that was changing things up a little bit and using all this interesting multi touch kind of expression on notes. Fairly simple sound engine, but still the way that you express notes. Uh, was cutting edge, and it also in, it incorporated um, visuals as well as audio and kind of you know, really put them together. The app is actually works on the latest system, iOS system, if anybody wants to check it out. It's Morphwiz, and it's still, you know, it's still pretty cool. It still looks good. You know, we refreshed it sometimes and updated the graphics a bit, mm -hmm. and uh, it's how the whole thing got started. And so that, you know, my passion for creating expressive instruments um, kind of came through that 
mechanism of having my own, of starting my own app company, which is called Wisdom, Wisdom with a Z, music. And, uh, and these days, I'm uh, actually, I'm talking to you from California, where I'm an artist in residence at Stanford University, the Karma Division, um, the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. And uh, I'm here because, uh, first of all, I, I used to come here showing like new expressive instruments to them like once a year or so. But finally, I teamed up with some of the guys here um, to, uh, to create an app called GeoShred which is kind of changing the, uh, the landscape a bit because it's uh, a very cutting edge, what we call an MPE controller. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's really a very powerful MIDI controller, uh, as well as having this really cool sound engine, called, uh, which is based on physical modeling, which was developed by Julius Smith, who is a professor here at Stanford. Um, so yeah, my, my, uh, that part of me is, uh, has been very happy actually for the last few months and it's, you know, something that I always stay involved with. Yeah. That seems like a surprisingly perfect blend of music and technology where you are now at Stanford. Yeah, yeah it's awesome. So, awesome. um, what, what do you want musicians to get out of your apps? Which I mean, now there's, how many do you have now? It's way more than just those two. Yeah, there's, I don't know, maybe about eight seven or eight different things out yeah. now um but there's the, the 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 most current one is the geo shred family of apps which is geo shred play geo shred control and geo shred pro uh and basically my idea when i make apps is that i want to create something that is um changing the changing the the, the landscape, if you will, or the possibility that people really usually think of in terms of creating music. So adding new expression in interesting ways, taking advantage of the technology to offer something that's new, something that, it, that serious musicians would think is uh, helpful and very cool towards creating expressive music. But at the same time, my one of my passions is to create uh, instruments and software where it brings people who ordinarily wouldn't be able to play music to be able to enjoy creating music. So kind of giving them the gift and the possibility of creating music on their own. Like uh, an example being uh, the latest version of GeoShred. We allow uh, various diatonic kinds of um, scales on the playing surface. So you could be playing the blues, for example, and you could be only playing the right notes, you know, like, like, uh, so, the, so the wrong notes are not even available to you, which is, uh, you know, to make playing, let's say, e e easier and fun. So the reality is that somebody could play on GeoShred, they could never have played a musical instrument before, but yes, they could actually make a really pretty cool sound. Right. So, uh, and I love that, but I love that especially if, it also um, attracts people who are experienced players and they can feel like, wow, I can do things on this that I've never been able to do before. So GeoShred kind of, I think, accomplishes that goal where it appeals to professional musicians and it also appears to, you know, kind of like the novice or the person who's never, might only have been a listener up to that point. Right. So, and for me, that's the, that's the thing I get the most out of your apps is they're inspiring and that's um, kind of the next thing I wanted to talk about. What keeps you inspired to keep making music after all these years and keep playing music? Um, yeah, I mean, music has always been what I've loved and what I've done. And it's, I'm, a, I'm pretty much, uh, you know, the, the kind of person who just has this one, you know, extreme passion. I mean, obviously I have my beautiful children and my wife and, and my family. But beyond that, all I really think about is music and, you know, I just love to play. I've always gone, you know, used music as a way to express myself. And, you know, in many ways, I'm more comfortable expressing myself at a piano than I am, you know, any, in, in, any, other, in any other way. So um, it doesn't take much for me to kind of like, you know, be inspired. I mean, if I'm, in ordinary life, you know, I could sit down and I could sit at the piano and play all day. There are things that might take away that inspiration like if something you know is just really distracting or something really demands my focus mm -hmm. it's not some so fun i mean at those points okay well i'm not feeling 
you know, this is hard to be inspired when you're dealing with maybe a crisis or something crappy. But um, ordinarily, if things are flowing pretty well, you know, if my hands are, you know, somewhat warm and, you know, just kind of sitting down at a piano or whatever, I can, you know, just come up with stuff and improvise all day, you know. Right. So what about creativity? How do you stay creative? Um, and, and again, it kind of relates to that. I mean, you know, most of my really like most of my serious projects are done when there's time set aside to make them happen. Mm-hmm. Um, being creative again, is not, it's not so much of a problem. I'm pretty much creative, uh, all the time because it's kind of the way I lead my life, but actually getting things done is more about setting aside the time, setting aside right. a window where you're not going to be interrupted and you can really focus. And, you know, I mean, I think that if I, um, you know, I could have a more creative time. Let's say if there's no distractions in a beautiful place with a mm. great instrument, yeah. you know, with all the, if everything lines up and it's perfect. Um, it's, it's about, I think for me, it's about not having distractions, having right. a window of time, being able to relax and just kind of get into my music. You know, one of the things that makes that helps my creativity is also the, you know, having an amazing instrument. If I put my hands down on a, you know, beautiful, piano like the one i have at home and you know i hear the sound well i'm very sensitive to sound so the sound brings me into a space and i use that space to kind of go you know and begin a sonic journey whether it's you know personal kind of like uh piano playing that i might do to create almost like a musical meditation for myself or maybe if i turn on my camera and i'm doing a live stream for social media and i just want to you know generate uh, a heads a musical headspace for others. I mean, just to have that time and to have a beautiful instrument and hear the sound and you know, like in the case of a piano, let it resonate and you know, go with the sound and 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 uh, kind of let it take over, you know, a bit. Things like that. Like the sound can bring me in. Like some of the best music I've written is when I'll buy, for example, like a new synthesizer. Or like mm-hmm. Korg will send me something. Like in the old days, they sent me uh, around the six degrees of inner turbulence album. They sent me a, uh, an instrument that was called the Karma, which is a great synthesizer. And it had all these amazing, like, you know, cool things that it could do. And uh, I just put my hand on it and it would inspire me like immediately. The sounds were just so great. I'd like play one note on it and be like, oh, I got an idea because this sound is so cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the so sounds can really kind of like, you know, get you there. Or, or I put my hand down on a, you know, a note. And it's like this amazing orchestral mixture with trombones and tubas and like, you know, basses, basses. And, you know, the right hand has these incredible French horns and, who knows, you know, and strings, and I go, oh, my God, and that will get, you know, that'll totally put me in the mood to play something very, like, you know, John Williams-like or something, or who right. knows. So the sound is a big influencer, and some of the greatest instruments are the ones that can really inspire you to make music. So that's a part of it, too. Have you worked in film composition yourself, or do you have any plans to in the future? Um, I am very interested in that. Um, and uh, have been exploring that option for sure. And probably in the future, I'll be doing more of that. That would be exciting to hear. <laughs> I would love to hear a Jordan Rudis yeah. score. Um, so you also do some teaching through your online conservatory, correct? Yes. Okay. So yes. how's, how's that going? I'd love to hear more about, um, that. Uh, the online conservatory is something that has been around for a long time. As a matter of fact, I think I'm one of the very first musicians to have started any kind of online education system. And that's because years ago, I had a Japanese student who was really into technology, and he offered to put some of my lessons online. This is literally before anybody knew about even the possibility of doing this. Right. So, and I kept it, and I kind of kept that going just because it was kind of cool without putting much uh, effort into it, um, but just leaving it there. And it was always a side thing. And then kind of while that was, while that was up there and happening, the, the world was kind of coming into that space and the online education was becoming more of a thing. And, you know, to, to this day where you have a lot of it, but still my online conservatory is there. And, and I, you know, in in more recent years, I've been putting more energy into that. We've developed a community of, uh, I think, like a few thousand participants in that, and um, so it's something that I that I uh, take seriously. Matter of fact, I just finished a whole round of a pretty cool 
um, technical exercises for keyboardists, um, which which we uh, we've been posting up slowly but surely. So it's a place where people can go, and there are hundreds and hundreds of um, exercises, both in technique and in harmony and rhythm. I do something called Ask Jordan, which, if you're a member of the online conservatory, you can reach out and ask me a question. Uh, through video or text, and I'll respond either through video or text as well. Um, there's a area where I can just like make it like this is kind of almost like a stream, not live, but a streaming video, and explain a concept. Um, so yeah, it's it's you know because I do so much traveling around the world and I'm generally very busy, it's a great mm -hmm. way for me to reach out and offer uh, some education and to enjoy kind of like teaching you know, to a, to a group rather than individuals, which I really don't have time to do. Right. So, um, but I love, you know, but I'm somebody who loves engaging uh, and interacting with people. So it's been a perfect way, another, another perfect way for me to kind of do that. And I have a wonderful partner um, uh, who kind of keeps, who uh, keeps things, you know, technically going, Danny Kosterich, who's over in Israel right now. And he kind of keeps the whole, he, he, he like runs the, uh, my entire online presence, whether it's my websites or, you know, or online conservatory, or whatever, he's kind of in charge of that. So yeah, altogether, that's definitely another aspect of, uh, you know, what, what I'm doing and something I really mm -hmm. care about. So what's the biggest mistake you see musicians make? Well, I think the biggest mistake is thinking that this is all going to be really easy and it's just going to happen. So they not only don't prepare themselves to play an instrument really well, but they also don't, you know, really investigate what's involved in real life to make something happen. They think it's just going to happen, like by some magical mystery event. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a huge mistake to go so far along the way and not being honest with yourself about you know, I mean, the, the problem is that music is a big hook. Everybody loves music, right? You know, and yeah, the pop music thing, you know, scene can get weird, and you can kind of like maybe have some success, even if you're not talented. If you just happen to catch some fashion thing or like whatever, sure. but you know, in general, it takes work. I mean, even for those people who are not talented, it it, it if you latch on somehow, it's going to take work at some point to keep it yeah. going. <laughs> so just to understand what's really involved, people need to, especially these days, they need to, you know, understand what the music business is all about, what you're getting into, how, how much effort it really takes, uh, and understand the landscape of the whole thing. And, you know, so that, I think that's the biggest mistake is just kind of like riding along and, you know, just floating. And then, especially because music is, can be a fairly, you know, ethereal, spiritual kind of thing, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's going with that and not understanding how it, how it relates to the, to the world and, and actually having a career in music. Right. So along those lines, what, what is some specific actionable advice you'd give to a musician uh, looking to make a career out of performance specifically? Um, well, actionable advice, it's, it's, you know, it's so tough. People ask me every day about what they can do in this, you know, world we're in to, uh, to make a career. First of all, I think it's really important to understand, um, you know, the, the social media internet part of things, because, you know, that's a big part of our world and to use it and to be able to use it effectively. And it's kind of like this really confusing, overcrowded space so you know to have a grip on that is really important and then you know everybody's always learning about that it changes day to day um but again that's another reason to uh you know to go to school for that kind of thing because there's great right. courses in, in how to you know do marketing and the music business and understanding that understanding the workings of the you know social media and the internet are i think really really important um <clears throat> the other thing is that, you know, again, like we were talking before, I mean, if you want to uh, make it as a performer, you have to, you, you have to not only be practicing really hard to get to the point, but you have to get out there and, and be social and meet people and, you know, and, and uh, understand what it means. Like, you know, everybody say, oh, I need a manager, I need an agent and kind of understand what that means. You know, a lot of people have a kind of a, 
that they don't understand, you know, at what point it's going to be helpful or even possible to have like a manager or an agent. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of information to really get, get a hold of, but mostly, you know, I honestly, my, I guess from where I am in, in my musical life, I would just say, you know, people shouldn't, shouldn't just think that it's some kind of like mysterious magic. You really have to work hard at whatever you do. And that's the best way to prepare to, to be, uh, you know, a performer or a right. studio musician or any, any of the above. Right. So, so speaking of working hard, what do uh, your practice routines look like nowadays? Um, well, it's my practice routine has been very intense lately because I've been preparing for these Bach to Rock concerts. I'm doing a European tour next month, and so uh, a lot of the music is challenging. So I've been trying to get over to like a real piano, which has you know the proper action, and just really working hard for uh, you know some hours every day to get my hands in shape to to make that happen. So when you know when, when when I have this kind of thing coming up, it's like a pretty serious practice routine that's got to happen. Right, exactly. So, uh, what what songwriting or composing tips would you have for musicians that are looking to kind of up their creativity if they don't necessarily have it in abundance, like someone like you may have? Um, well, yeah, I mean, songwriting again. I mean, a lot of these questions are coming down to a similar thing. <laughs> Songwriting, you know, that's that's an art form. That's something you know, people, uh, some people are just natural kind of songwriters. They might have a really great ear or a good flow for it. Other people want to write songs and they're a little bit more confused about it coming into it. Maybe they're maybe they're more uh, into the lyric side of it. And they're not uh, as you know uh, um, experienced or talented at the music side, so you know a great songwriting course is is probably what you know they would need to do to study song forms. A lot of times, you know, it's uh, you have to, you have to work within a particular window or a particular form to uh, kind of get to the next level. Like for me, when I was learning composition as a young person. I was asked to write music in different styles or with different kind of harmonic ideas. Like my mm -hmm. teacher would assign to me one week, we'd look at uh, chords with alternate bass notes, uh, like taking a C major chord and putting an F under it, you know, or anything that was not using like a root kind of position or even an inversion, a typical inversion, and write a piece with it. So, like, you know, one thing that would be helpful to somebody who's trying to learn or craft a song is, you know, try to write a song in a particular form. Follow the form of one of your favorite songs, like, you know, whether it's verse, chorus, verse, release, whatever, you know, and just try to try to really match that, even matching the number of measures, just so you can get a feeling or get an education for how, how you know, songs have been written. Mm -hmm. Um because uh, you know, form is really, really uh, is critical. And even and when I work with other musicians, it's interesting to notice how how um, some are more into the form factor and really the architecture of a song. Some are more into kind of letting things just flow. And you know, it all in a band situation, it all it helps to have all the different energies. But somebody who's really conscious of the form, it's going to be really, really helpful. Um, you know, to that process. So. Yeah, I think for a young songwriter to, uh, you know, study kind of what's come before them uh, is uh, something that should should not be avoided. Gotcha. So for you, it's all coming back to the education and the and put it in the work. Yeah, and probably just because of my background, you know, a lot of times I'm having been. Uh, you know, coming from a classical background, I mean, not right. really and, and 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 you know, it's coming from a place where I, you know, the more I lead my life, the more I appreciate everything that I've studied and what I've learned and how much mm -hmm. I've practiced, because that's who you know who I am and what I what I build on. It's like a foundation. But I think you know, even if you're not a Juilliard student or a Berkeley student, you need to have some way to have a foundation of knowledge and experience um, to be able to build you know, your, your career, your, your musical life uh, needs to come from somewhere. If your foundation is shaky, then, you know, if there's no real structure to who you are, 
uh, knowledge, experience, practice, then there's a good chance that you'll be, you know, knocked over pretty easily and nothing's going to happen just because mm -hmm. there's nothing that's solid and strong and, you know, about, about who you are. Right. So I'm a big believer in just kind of building a, you know, a solid structure to, to work from. Okay. Great. Whether it's, whether it's a key, whether it's a keyboard <laughs> technique, guitar technique, or, you mm -hmm. know, being a master craftsman on how to put songs together, or if you're an audio engineer to really understand analog and digital and the tools and, you know, and go from there. Got it. So what's some of your favorite uh, new music maybe of the last year to two years that's been released? Um, favorite new music. Well, I'm, I'm kind of into a lot of different kinds of music these days uh, and I go through periods of time where I'll listen to music more than other times. Mm -hmm. I tend to gravitate towards things that are a little bit more mellow than most people might think uh, that I listen to. I'm um, a big fan of Cigaros or some people say Cigaros. Um, I don't know, I know who they are but uh, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a group out of Iceland it does kind of spacey almost like Pink Floydish kind of music. Right. I'm always a big fan of my, what my friend Stephen Wilson produces. I really love his music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love Stephen Wilson. I think, I think he's great. Um, I like the uh, um, electronic music scene. Uh, I always have my eyes on what guys like Richard Devine uh, are doing or groups like uh, Autiker or some people say Autekra. Um, uh, what else do I like? Um, you know, some of the pro some of the younger prog groups uh, are doing, you know, really good things like Periphery or Animals as Leaders. I'm always interested to hear what they play. Um, you know, Haken uh, is a really good yo younger prog group. Stuff like that. Well, Jordan, thank you so much for being a part of the show. You've been so generous with your time, and um, I wanted to know where can our listeners find you and, and support you. Uh, the best place is my website, jordanrudis.com. It lists all my tour dates. It has links to uh, my uh, KeyFest, which will have happened by the time that you uh, you know, have this release. KeyFest mm -hmm. is a yearly event we have this year. It's, it will have been at Sweetwater Sound. It's a wonderful hangout for keyboard players to learn um, keyboard players and jam and hang out. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like the hub for, for all the things that I do. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much, man, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Hey, guys. First of all, thank you so much for listening. If you could please take a quick moment to subscribe on iTunes and leave a rating and review, your feedback seriously is really important, and it helps us keep the show alive. Check out MusiciansTalkShow.com to sign up for our mailing list. If you do, we're going to send you our main theme song and a few other surprises. Plus, you'll always be the first to know what episodes are coming up. If you want to help support the show so we can keep putting out the highest quality content possible, please follow the Support the Show link at our website and consider donating to our Patreon page. Lastly, if you have an idea for a guest or a question you want to discuss, contact us through any of the contact forms on our website, and we'll do everything we can to make it happen. Whew, all right. That was a lot, but we got through it. Thanks again, guys, and we will see you soon. Music